feedback from you about that and, and again feel free to ask questions whenever you, you have that. Um, so last week we started with the material for sensitivity analysis and I talked about two different ways in which we're going to look at this material. We're going to look at the graphical uh, solution of graphical sensitivity analysis and also we're going to look at the algebraic uh, method for sensitivity. So, we look at the, the first part, basically, we were looking at how the right-hand side of the constraints, once you change the right-hand side, how can that affect your optimal solution. So, we look at this example, specifically the Jocko manufacturer, in which we had two products and two machines, and we have some constraints in terms of the capacities. Mm -hmm. Product 2 requires one unit, requires one hour on machine 1, and three hours on machine 2. And actually, product 1 requires two hours on machine 1 and one hour on machine 2. And product 2 requires one hour on machine 1 and three hours on machine 2. So we formulate the problem, and we wanted to maximize our profit. We know the profit for each type of product, and we have some limitations in terms of the machine capacity. So we have we have two machines, and we want to use those machines as optimal as possible. So these are our constraints. This is our objective function. We solve the problem using the graphical method, and the optimum was in this point C. 
C, which is x1 equals 3.2 and 1.6. Um, so from there, we talk about how to how moving this one of the constraints or adding an extra hour of capacity for one of those machines, how will that affect the optimal solution? And we look at specifically at machine one. So by adding one unit of machine one, one hour to machine one, we saw that the optimal solution changed from point C to this point here, and the optimal solution was increased. Okay, so from there we we, we compute the, the slope or the derivative which is the rate of change. In this case, the rate of revenue change resulting from increasing machine one capacity by one hour. And we stated the formula for that particular case, and that will basically apply to uh, all the other problems as well. One thing that you need to understand is that when you have when you're trying to compute this uh, rate of revenue or the dual price, you have to be aware that you are applying that specifically for this constraint because if you change the value for that constraint, you know that that will affect your feasible region because it is a feasible binding constraint. But for example, if you have another constraint coming from this, like this, if you have such a constraint, if you move this constraint to, first of all, you know that that is not a binding constraint for the optimal solution because it does not affect the optimal solution. And if you move that constraint from here to here, it will have no effect in the optimal solution because it is not a binding constraint for the optimal solution. But this constraint for machine one, you know, if you move that constraint to the left, that will change the value of the optimal solution because it is binding that point, okay? So, when you start looking at the dual prices for some of the solutions, you will get to a point in which you will see that some of the dual prices are zero. What that means is that that specific capacity constraint has no effect on the optimal solution because if you move it from here to here, the optimal solution will, will remain the same. Okay, so I just wanted to clarify that point. So we're looking, still looking at the first case, which is when we make changes to the right-hand side of the constraint, which is the capacity. So um, we talk about the name unit worth of a resource, which is a description of the rate of change of the objective function per unit change of the resource. This name unit worth of a resource is coined as the dual price or the shadow price in LP. Okay? So this name is now standard as in all LP literature and software. So when you look at the, maybe next time when we solve the problem using Excel, you will see that Excel uses the dual price terminology. So by looking at the graph, we can see that the dual price of 14 hours remains valid for changes in machine one capacity that move is constrained parallel to itself to any point in the line segment B, 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 F. Okay, so moving that line parallel to itself, you know, it is a binding constraint, so if you move it, the optimal solution will change. And that's what we explained that time. So if you move that constraint, you know, in this case, the optimal will be here, and in that case, it will be there. Okay, so 
this is reinstating the what I just said, which is the same slide. So we compute the machine one capacities at point B and F as follows. So we were looking at those quarter points for the capacity constraint for machine one. So B and F, and we found the capacities for those two points. And using those capacities, we were able to identify the range in which the optimal solution will still the same. Okay, so that range was, machine capacity was between 2.67 hours and 16 hours. Changes outside this range produce a different dual price. Okay, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna learn how to change, how to compute the new objective function uh, later in this course. But for now, you just have to know if you go outside those limits, the dual price will change. Using similar computations, we did the same thing for machine number two. And we found that the machine two capacity for keeping the same optimal solution has to be within four hours and 24 hours. Okay, so the computer limits for machine one and two are referred as to as the feasibility rate, three ranges. All software packages provide information about the dual prices and their feasibility ranges, so we're going to look at those next time. Uh, the dual prices allow making economic decisions about the LP problem as the following questions. So we went through these questions last time, and I think you saw the benefit of understanding how the dual prices work and how can you make recommendations to your manager or maybe to your boss in the future based on the dual prices from your LP. Okay, so if you want to get something from this course, this will be one of the most important part. Okay, because you can get an optimal solution, but if that is not feasible, let's say you don't have enough money, you can always check what are the other options using the dual prices. Okay, so from there, I want to go to the second case, but before we get to that part, I um, want to make sure that you're understanding what we are covering so far. So I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to work in this problem. This is not to be graded. We're going to discuss this in class. But I, don't want, I just want you to think about it for a few minutes. You can work in, in groups if you want. Yeah, I have four copies, so... Please try to work uh, with a team, with a partner. So we're going to discuss this here. You can work with him. And this is basically applying what we learned last time and also uh, the concepts are to all prices. Okay, so I, I can help you with the first part. I don't want you to spend a lot of time on formulating and finding the graphical solution. So we have two type of cowboy hats. Type one has hat requires twice as much labor time as type two. If all the available labor time is dedicated to type two alone, the company can produce a total of 400 type two hats a day. Okay, so that's our first constraint. Uh, the respective market limits for the two types are 150 and 200 hats per day. 
and the revenue is eight dollars per type one and five dollars per type two so what are you trying to do in this problem again this is a production type of problem so we are trying to maximize the number of units will give you the, the total revenue and you have a different revenue for each type of wrap hat so our decision variables are the following so we have x1 equals daily number of type 1 and x2 equals daily number of type 2 okay so these are the units that you're going to be producing or this particular case you have two types of hats and you want to know how many of each you want to produce you know the revenue you're going to make for each type of hat right so you're maximizing your profit so for type one you have a benefit or a profit of eight dollars times x1 plus five x2 which is the profit that you're going to make for the second type and then you have your constraints so the problem is telling you that the labor time to type 2 alone you can produce 400 and the type 1 hat requires twice as much labor than type 2 so this is basically telling you that x1 is going to take twice as time that you need for the second hat and you know that if you only produce x2 you can produce 400 okay so that means that if you only produce one you're going to produce only 200 okay and then you have the constraints for your uh, demand or the number that you can produce per type so x1 is less than or equal to 150 and x2 is less than or equal to 200 and then x1 and x2 needs to be greater or equal to zero any questions okay so again as you can see every time you see a production problem this is basically the same format that you're going to follow you want to maximize your profit depending on the number of units that you will produce and the product type so if you only have one product you will have profit times the number of units if you have more than one then you're going to continue adding those type of products and your profit then you have the capacity limitation in terms of the hours and then you have the demand that you need to satisfy it if the case is you need to set up produce more than a certain number you know that this constraint will be greater or equal to that number if you have the capacity limitation in terms of that you have a limit of units that you want to produce because you know that's the number that you're going to sell then that type of constraint will be a less than or equal okay so we have this we have our problem now we want to solve it using the graphical method and do you remember why we can apply the graphical method to this problem? Why? It's only two values. Correct. So that's why we can apply the graphical method. So really quick. So here we have x1 and x2 me to so this is 40 80 120 160 200 and then I have the same this side 40 80 120, 160, 
Okay, so let me, so for the demand, we have X1 being less than or equal to 150. So we, around here, and then we have X2 less than 200, so that's this one. And then we have the capacity to x1 plus x2. So for that one, if you make x1 0, x2 is 400. So this is 360, 400. So you have this point. And if you make x2 0, then x1 is 200. So you have this point. And let's see if we can. Okay, so the optimal solution, and you can verify this on your own, is this point, and your feasible region is this area. This point C. What are the coordinates for this point? This is 150 and 200. This one is 200, 0 and 200. And this one is 100 and 200. Okay, so you have the optimal solution now, and I, and that's what you need now to compute the second part, part B. So I'll let you work on that one. And let me know if you, if you have questions. So you, now you have your optimal solution. This and the value for the optimal solution is. 800 times plus 5 times 200. So the production capacity of type 2 hat is this one. So you have a 200 constraint here. You can go from, this is the range. You know if you move this constraint, the optimal solution will change because these two are dividing this one and this one. 
So if you move this constraint parallel in this space, that will give you a different optimal solution. Okay, so the question is saying determine the dual price of the production capacity in terms of the type 2 hat and the range for <laughs> which it's uh, applicable. So this is the constraint for type 2 hat. So you have to compute the capacity at this point and the capacity at this point, and also compute the different uh, objective functions. What will be the objective function at this point and the objective function at this point? Say that again. You, you will compute the dual price if it goes that information. Yes. Okay, so I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep this here and I'm going to use the board so everyone can see from, from there, but it's right here. Okay. So, okay, so part B, we have this point A and this point C. And we want to know what are the capacity at both, right? So A... This point is 0 and 200, and Z is 150 and 200. Okay, so um, I'm looking at the constraint for the capacity. So the capacity constraint. is 2x1 plus x2 less than or equals to 400. So now I want to plug in these numbers here. And that will give me the capacity at this point. So that is 2 times 0 plus 200. And that equals... 100. Same thing for point C. This is 2 times 150 plus 2 one. And this is 500. Yes. Okay, so now I have the capacity at this point and at this point. Now, what else do I need to So remember the dual price equals work divided by the capacity unit. 
So the word is the difference of the objective functions at that at this point and at this point. So that that break of change, oh, I know how would my objective function change when I move in this line. So z, the objective function is a x1 plus pi x2. So if I do the same thing for a, which is 0 and 200, that would be equal to a times 0 plus 5 times 200. That's 1,000. And for z, that is 150 times 200. That is 8 times 150 plus 5 times 200. And that equals 2200. So now I know the difference for the work and the difference for the capacity. So the dual price is 2200 minus 1000 divided by the difference in the capacity, which is 500 minus 200. That will be equal to $4 per type to that. So every time I add a unit for the capacity, I will increase my profit by four dollars. Okay, so the dual price for the capacity of the production capacity in terms of the type two hat is four dollars. Now, what would happen? This is case or question Z. If the daily demand limit of type 1 hat is decreased from 120 20 is decreased to 120, which is this. Okay, so the constraint that represents the, the daily demand limit of type 1 is this one. The vertical constraint So right now that value or that constraint is less than or equal to 150. The question is, if the daily demand limit of, on type 1 hat is decreased to 120, use the dual price to determine the corresponding effect on the optimal revenue. So if I move that constraint to here, Will that affect the optimal solution? No. The optimal solution is still the same. Okay? So when that happens, that happens, but that means is that the dual price is zero. Because there will be no change in the optimal solution. Okay? Which is what I tried to explain earlier today. Okay, so the answer for that part will be the dual price is zero. There's no change. Okay, so you always have to look at the binding constraints. And again, this is for the case in which you have two variables. It will be impossible for you to grab a model in which you have multiple variables, more than two variables. So for those cases, you will probably need to solve the problem using the simplest method or a computer. Both cases, you will be able to understand when the dual price is zero. Um, but when you look at the graphical method, they tell you to understand what's going on. Okay? So if you move that demand to here, you'll see that the optimal solution will still the same. So that would not affect your optimal solution. So that means that your dual price, if you move that demand to 120, will not change because there's no rate of change for that particular uh, part. But what would happen if you move it here? 
that will affect your optimal solution. And for those cases, you will have to recompute the, the actual optimal solution, which is the optimal analysis that we're going to discuss next time. Okay? Okay, good. So I hope that can give you a better um, idea of what we're trying to, to achieve with this lecture. Now I'm going to transition to the second case. So for now, we're just focusing on when you change the capacity of your resources. Okay, so so far, we are looking at a machine that we are allocating 10 hours, and we want to know what would happen with our production plan if we add an extra hours to that machine, or two hours to that machine. That's the type of question that we want to understand or we're trying to answer with this lecture. So if I have 150 units in plan and I decrease that to 120, would that affect my, my optimal schedule or my optimal solution? The answer is no. Okay, so that would not affect your profit, basically. Okay, so now we're going to look at instead of changing the capacity of your resource, try to answer now is what will happen change the by producing a particular product and that is the second case okay so now you know that the profit that you're making where is that profit in the in the linear programming model? Where do you usually put that profit? Is it in the constraints? Is it in the decision variables? Is it in the objective function? Where do you usually put that profit? Objective function. Okay. So if you want to deal with changes in your profit, you have to change the values in your objective function, and that is the second case that we're going to study in this lecture. So, changes in revenue units, i.e. the objective function coefficients, will change the slope of Z, which is the objective function, or the optimal objective function. However, the optimal solution at point C remains unchanged so long as the objective function lies between lines B, F, and D. So we are referring back to the, the example we discussed earlier in this lecture, which is the job code example. And what we're trying to say, we remember from, from the solution, or the graphical solution, we have two constraints for machine one. This is the capacity of production for machine one. This is the capacity of production for machine two. And we found that the optimal solution was in this point. But remember from the graphical solution method, you needed to graph an isoprofit line to determine where the optimal solution is. Okay? So if you look at that isoprofit, what the, the analysis or the sensitivity analysis is saying is, as long as that line that represents the objective function, in this case is this dot line here, is between these two constraints, the optimal solution will be the same. So you can change the coefficients for the objective function, you can change the revenue that you make for each one of the products that you want to produce, as long as those coefficients the slope that you're going to get for that objective function is between the constraints or the binding constraints, in this case, this constraint and this constraint, if that slope allows you to keep that objective function between those constraints, your optimal solution will be the same. Okay, so your production schedule will not change. Okay, so 
how can we determine the range for the coefficients of the objective function that will keep the optimal solution change? Okay, so first, what you need to do is to write the objective function in the general format. So, maximize z equals c1 times x1 plus c2 times x2. Now, again, we are referring back to the, to the example. So imagine now that the line is pivoted at C and that it can rotate clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay, so we are rotating this objective function slope at the optimal solution. The optimal solution will remain at point C so long as this objective function slope lies between the two lines or the constraints x1 plus 3x2 equals 8 and 2x1 plus x2 equals 8, which are our original constraints for this problem. This means that the ratio c1 and c2, this ratio c1 and c2 are the coefficients for your objective function, can vary between one third and 2 over 1, which are the coefficients for your constraints, which yields the following optimality range, which is 1 over 3 less than or equal to C1, C2, less than or equal to 2 over 1, or 0 0.333 less than or equal to C1 over C2 less than or equal to 2. So if you change your coefficients or your revenue for your products, as long as the rate or the ratio for those coefficients is within these two bounds, that means that your optimal solution will remain the same. Okay? So, let's look at some questions that we can discuss based on this type of analysis. So, question one. Suppose that the unique revenues from products one or two are changed to 35 and 25 respectively. Um, will the current optimum remain the same? What would you need to do? So this will be C1 and this one will be C2. So based on our discussion, what would you do is just compute that ratio. So it will be C1 divided by C2. And since that 1.4 is within the 0.33 and 2 range, that means that it will keep the same solution at point C as the optimum. And the optimum value of changes to 35 and 25 will be equal to 152. So we go back here, 1.4 is within this range. So your solution will still the same. And the optimal value will change to 152 because now you have different numbers for, for the revenue. Do you can you relate this to what we learned in the simplex method? Do you have any idea of why this ratio works? Basically, what you're trying to find out is those ranges in which your basic values will remain the same. Okay, so if you are out of those bounds, 
that means that your basic variables are going to change. You're going to have to enter a new basic variable or a non-basic variable to your solution. Okay? So as long as you are within these bounds, that means that your basic variables will be the same and you will keep the same optimal solution. Now question two says, uh, suppose that the unit revenue of product two is fixed and its current value is C2 equals 20. What is the associated optimality range for the unit revenue for product one? So find C1 that will keep the optimal solution unchanged. So what you're going to do is you're going to use the same ratio. You know the value of C2. You want to find the value of C1. So in that case, it's basically use the range 1 over 3 times 20 less than or equal to C1 and 2 times 20 or 6.67 less than or equal to C1 less than or equal to 40. So what this is telling you is if you change the price or the revenue that you're making for C2 to 20, if you want to keep the same optimal solution, then C1 has to be within this bound. Okay? So you can increase the price of C1 up to 40. You will keep the same production schedule, but you might be able to increase your profit. Okay? Any questions so far? Okay, and as, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to get keep or learn something or you want to this is something that you're going to be using. At some point, if you are requested to build this uh, optimization model, linear programming model, if you're working on production schedules, you might be involved with this type of models. Um, again, it's very important and very useful. Now, um, let's... So this basically concludes the first part of this lecture, which is how to use graphical sensitivity analysis. Now, I'm going to switch to a different method, which is the algebraic sensitivity analysis. And you will see that these two different methods will give you exactly the same um, type of answer. So, this section demonstrates the general idea of sensitivity analysis using the algebraic method. Two cases will be discussed, which are the same cases we discussed with the graphical method. The first one is the sensitivity of the optimal solution to changes in the availability of the resources, which are the right-hand side of the constraints. And the second case will be the sensitivity of the optimal solution to changes in unit profit or unit cost, which are the coefficients of the objective function, and which is what we just discussed using the graphical method. Okay, so two cases, changes in the availability, number of hours that I have for this particular resource, and changes in your profit, which is the objective function. Okay, so now I'm going to use a different example, and this is a problem you already saw in class. Um, Toyco is a company that uses three operations to assemble three type of toys, trains, trucks, and cars. We have the daily available time for the three operations are this in minutes. So these are your capacities for the three operations. And you have the revenues, again, for each type of product. You have the assembly times per train and the three operations are this one. And you have the same requirement, well, different requirements for different products. If we let X1, X2, and X3 represent the daily number of units uh, assembly, we can formulate these production 
problem as follows. So again, we have a production type of problem, so we want to maximize our profit. And that profit is given, remember, definition of the decision variables are here. So x1 will represent the trains. So we want we'll have a profit of three dollars, two dollars, and five dollars respectively. So we have three times x1 plus two times x2 plus five times x3. And we are maximizing our profit. Three different products, three different revenues. I want to maximize that revenue. And that will be based on the number of units that I will produce for each type of product. And this is subject to three operations. So operation one, operation two, and operation three. Okay, so operation one, you have 430. Operation 2, you have 460, and Operation 3, you have 420. So you know that for the first one, this has to be less than or equal to 430. This one has to be less than or equal to 460, and this one needs to be less than or equal to 420. Okay, and now we're going to look at the requirements for each type of product. So, for operation one, you need one unit for the train, you need two units for the truck, and you need one unit for the cars. So, that means that you have X1 plus 2X2 plus X3 needs to be less than or equal to 430. Does that make sense? You are looking at the operations independently, and we have to look at the requirements for each type of product, for each operation. So the trucks, well, the trains will require one minute, the truck will require two minutes, and the trains will, the cars will require only one minute for operation one. We do the same thing for the other two operations. Here we have 2, 3, and 0. So, I'm sorry, it's 3, 0, and 2. So this is 3, x1, plus 2, x3. And the last one is x1 plus 4x2 plus 0x3. We have x1, x2, and x3 greater or equal to 0. And you have formulated another collection type of problem. So, very standard, right? You have your availability for your resources. In this case, you have operations. You have your profit, and you have the requirements for, for the units. Okay, so from there, if you solve this problem to optimality, that's what I'm showing here in this tableau. This is the optimal tableau for the simplex method. And this is basically telling you that you have a profit of $1,350 when you produce these units. So from this solution, can you tell me how many trains, how many trucks, and how many cars? How many trains? Correct? Zero. Because x1 equals zero. How many trucks? This is x2. OK. 
can hear you. How many say a hundred? Raise your hand. Yes, it's a hundred. <laughs> and how many cars? Correct. So this is coming from this right hand side of the tableau. X6 is a slack variable, so it's not part of the production schedule. Okay, so we have those units. <clears throat> And determination, <clears throat> we're going to use this method to determine the dual prices and the feasibility ranges. So suppose that D1 or capital D1, D2, and D3 are the positive or negative changes made in the allotted day manufacturing times of operations 1, 2, and 3. So meaning that if you want to add more time, to each one of the operations, or if you want to decrease the time for each one of the operations, we can represent those using these variables. Okay, so this is how you can use those variables in your uh, model. So basically, you can add those variables at the end or at the right hand side. So D1 basically is telling you that if you increase your minutes for operation, for the first operation, if D1 equals 10, then instead of having 430, you will have 440. Okay? But for now, we're going to keep those as values. Okay? So, you want to know what would, be, what would be the effect of changing those operation capacities that you have. Okay, so we add those variables, one per constraint. Okay, so to express the optimal simplest tableau of the modified problems in terms of the changes, D1, D2, and D3, we first rewrite the starting tableau using the new right-hand sides. And these are our new right-hand sides, are right here. So what we are basically doing is we are adding these three constraints here. One per, one per variable, and this number here is basically telling you that D1 corresponds to this first variable, this one corresponds to the second one, and this one corresponds to the third one. Okay, and as you can see from here, these two areas are the same. Okay, so those two columns or areas of the tableau are the same. Hence, if we repeat the same simplex iterations as in the original model, the columns in the two highlighted areas will also be identical in the optimal tableau. Right? Because we are basically performing the same operation. So at the end, in the optimal tableau, you will see that these are the same. Okay, so those two areas are the same. Okay, the new optimal tableau provides the following optimal solution. So if you want to write the optimal solution based on this tableau, you will have Z equals 1350 plus D1 plus D2. X2 will be equal to a hundred plus one half D1 minus one fourth D2. Uh, this should be two. Say that again. So you're basically taking this row. Now we started with this one. Okay. 
Now for the next one, this is x3 equals 230 plus 1 half t2 and x6 equals 20 minus 2 d1 plus d2 plus d3. Okay, so the optimal solution is the same, but now what we are doing is we are adding these coefficients based on these additional variables. Okay. And you will see why or how this will help us to find the dual prices. So the optimal solution again is here. This is what I just wrote. So the equation shows that a unit. Okay, so this is basically stating that dual prices. The value of the objective function can be read it as this. So it's basically adding a coefficient for d3, and you know that is zero. So the equation shows that a unit change in the operation one capacity changes C by one dollar. So if you look at the objective function here, if you increase this dual price by one, this will increase the objective function by one unit. Now, you do the same type of analysis for operation capacity, operation to capacity changes, that's D2, that will increase your unit by two. And the last one by zero. This means that by definition, the corresponding dual prices are 1, 2, and 0 dollars per minute for operations 1, 2, and 3 respectively. Okay, so you can see how those variables help you find out what will be those dual prices in your objective function. Okay. Okay, so the feasibility range, okay, we want to know for which ranges we can keep our optimal solution. So the feasibility range, the current solution remains feasible if all the basic variables remain non-negative. That is, so we have our basic variables are x2, and we know that the current value is given by 100 plus one half d1 minus one fourth d2 and this is saying that if we want to keep our optimal solution the basic variables will have to be non-negative so this has to be greater or equal to zero our second basic variable is x3 so 230 plus one half d2 has to be greater or equal to zero and x6 20 minus 2 d1 plus d2 plus d3 needs to be greater than or equal to zero Okay, so we need to satisfy these non-negativity constraints to for the current solution to remain feasible. Simultaneous changes to D1, D2, and D3 that satisfy these inequalities will keep the solution feasible. The near optimal solution can be found by substituting out the values of D1, D2, and D3. 
Okay, so those are our dual prices. For example, suppose that the manufacturing time available for operations 1, 2, and 3 are 480, 440, and 400 minutes. Then D1 will be equal to the difference between the new values, which are this one listed here, and the original values, which was 430. D2, again, is the difference, and D3 is the difference. So, we have the values for D1, D2, and D3. So, if we substitute these values in the feasibility conditions, we get the following. X2 will be equal to 100 plus 1 half times 50 minus 1 4 times minus 20 and this is equal to 130 so this is greater than 0 it is feasible x3 equals 230 plus 1 half times minus 20 so this is 220 Again, this is greater than zero, so this is feasible. The third one, x6 equals 20 minus 2 times 50 plus minus 20 plus minus 10, and this equals minus 110. So what happened with this solution? Is it the feasible solution? So again, the feasibility conditions say that in order to be feasible, all of them needs to be greater or equal to zero. So that condition is not satisfied by x6. So x6 is less than zero, and this is infeasible. So the current solution does not remain feasible. So those new numbers are not valid. Question? Okay. This one is 10. Minus 10. Yeah, it should be 20. Yeah. Thank you. So it's 20, 80, minus 100. So this should be 120, actually, right? Can you these slides for today? Okay? So I can post it today so you can have access to the notes. Okay, so now let's let's look at the different examples. So let's say we change the values to these. 400, 448, and 430. So we go back, do the same thing. So we have 400 minus 430 minus 30 minus 12 and 10. So, doing the same thing, x2 will be equal to 88, which is greater than 0 and feasible. x3 will be equal to 224, which is again greater than 0 and is feasible. And x6 
6 equals 78, which is greater than 0, and also feasible. So the new optimal feasible solution is should be x2 equals 88, x3 equals 424, and x6 equals 78. So this one should be x2. Okay, so we repeated the process. We have some new capacities. We check the solutions are feasible, so we can get a new objective function, which is 1,296. Okay, so the given conditions can produce the individual feasibility ranges associated with changing the resources one at a time. So instead of looking at the changes to all of them, we can look at one by itself. So to do that, we can make d2 and d3 equal zero and focus only on d1. So the simultaneous conditions, this ones, are now reduced to the following. So essentially what you're going to do is just make them zero. So x2 will be a hundred plus one half d1 and needs to be greater or equal to zero. x3 will be equal to 230 and this is always greater than zero. And x6 is 20 minus 2d1 greater or equal to zero. So if you solve these equations, you will get that d1 needs to be greater or equal to 200. Here there's no d1 involved. In this one, d1 has to be greater, less than or equal to 10. And that gives you the feasibility range for d1. So D1 needs to be greater or equal to minus 200. D1 needs to be less than or equal to 10, which is what we have here. So as long as those door prices are within the range, then you are guaranteed to have your optimal or keep your optimal solution. We can show in a similar manner that the feasibility ranges for operations two and three are these two. So we can now summarize the dual prices and their feasibility ranges for the COICO model as follows. So we computed the dual prices for each operation. So an extra minute of operation one will increase your profit by one dollar. An extra time for operation two will increase your profit by two hours, by two dollars, sorry. The feasibility range is telling you that as long as you keep your dual prices within this range, your optimal solution will not change. And you have the minimum, the current, and the maximum times that you can allocate to your operations. Okay, so if you have this type of summary, that allows you to make a lot of decisions in terms of your pro action. Okay, so I'll stop here today. Um, I might. Okay, so this is a question that I have for you. Do you prefer to have the homework assigned today? So that will give you some time to work before spring break, and then you can rest with the spring break or you want to have the homework assigned on Thursday? Today? Okay, so I will, I will assign the homework today. So I will give you time. You will have to turn it after spring break anyway, okay? But you, I will give you some time to work before spring break. And if you have questions, you can come to me and help me. Okay, so um, again, I'll be available this afternoon. And that's all for today. <laughs>